We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone, my name is Elena Kidd and I'm a program director with the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. And I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Protect and Preserve Priorities for Antimicrobial Stewardship, featuring Dr. Matt Brown from the University of Alabama at Birmingham Hospital. This webinar is made possible by the Alabama Center for Infection Prevention and Control Training and Technical Assistance, or ARC IPC. The ARC IPC was established to meet the consultation and support service needs surrounding infection prevention and control throughout the state of Alabama. The center is a collaborative effort of the Alabama Department of Public Health, Infectious Disease and Outbreaks Division, and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. The ARC IPC tra provides training and technical assistance to infection prevention and control and public health professionals in areas needed to detect, respond to, control, and prevent infectious disease outbreaks. You can learn more about the center, view and listen to past webinars and trainings and podcasts, sign up for our newsletter, request training and technical assistance, and view infection prevention and control resources at uab.edu slash ARCIPC. And you can also email ARCIPC at uab.edu with any questions. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors for today's webinar, the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety and the Region 4 Public Health Training Center. You can learn more about their programs and the centers as a whole on their websites listed on the slide. So keeping on a similar theme of antibiotic use, we would like to let you know about our upcoming webinar, Patient Perceptions about Antibiotic Use, Resistance, and Stewardship on December 14th with Dr. Alistair Throat from the University of Utah School of Medicine. And once available, more information about this webinar will be placed on our website and announced through a news blast from the ARC IPC. This webinar will also be presented from the ARC IPC and co-sponsored by the Region 4 Public Health Training Center and the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety. And again, registration information will be available soon. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses by the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety for this webinar. In order to receive credit for this training, you must register for the training watch the entire program, complete the evaluation following the program, and upon completion of the evaluation, you're gonna be redirected to the Alabama Nursing CEU request form, which you will also need to complete. CEUs will be awarded by the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety. You do not have to submit directly to the Alabama Board of Nursing. CEU units for this program will expire on November 1st, 2023. If you're seeking a certificate of participation, you're going to follow the same instructions on this slide, um, and a certificate of participation will be sent within two weeks following the webinar. If you have any questions or experience any issues with the CEUs, please email arcipc at uab.edu, and we're going to place this email in the chat box as well. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Matthew Brown. Dr. Brown is the supervising pharmacist for antimicrobial stewardship and the director of the PGY2 Infectious Disease Pharmacy Residency Program at UAB Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. Dr. Brown specializes in infectious disease pharmacotherapy, pharmacotherapy and works to improve the quality and safety of antimicrobial use across the healthcare continuum. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Brown. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody today. Um, I'm excited to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, um, which is antimicrobial stewardship and what that really means and, and why it's important. And so uh, I'll just dive right into things. Um, I have nothing uh, relative to this uh, presentation to disclose to the group. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I would like everybody to be able to define antimicrobial stewardship, describe the benefits and risk of antimicrobial use, and also review strategies to improve antimicrobial utilization. And so I want to start by just a simple definition of what is antimicrobial stewardship. I know several of you have probably heard of that term or that phrase, and and you have an idea of what it means just because it's a little bit self-explanatory, but if you were to define this, um, if you Googled it or, or looked it up in different references and resources, um, you would find a definition very similar to what's on the screen here. And basically it's a coordinated program that promotes the appropriate use of antimicrobials 
improves patient outcomes, reduces an antimicrobial resistance, and prevents the spread of infections caused by multidrug resistant organisms. And so that's a bit of a mouthful. So what is it really? <laughs> In my mind, antimicrobial stewardship is a lot of things, and it's really anything and everything that accomplishes two primary goals. And so the number one goal, the most important thing related to antimicrobial stewardship is we want to improve patient outcomes. That's why we do what we do every day. Everybody on this call cares about people. They want to help people get better, um, have just better health outcomes and that sort of thing. So that's what that's what we do as healthcare workers. Um, but anything that accomplishes that number one goal, but also simultaneously minimizes the negative effects of antimicrobial use, in my mind, that's antimicrobial stewardship. And so why is this important? Antibiotics are very important life-saving medications. If you look at trends from history, uh, you can see that the life expectancy um, going from the 1700s up to present day um, has dramatically changed. And you can see that kind of between the 1700s and 1900s, the life expectancy worldwide was uh, not very old. Um, people kind of lived into their 30s or so. Um, and then you can see this sharp increase after the early 1900s. Um, and why is that? Um, there's probably a lot of things that contributed to this, but most notably um, in the early 1900s was the development of antib antibiotics. Um, penicillin, one of the first antibiotics available, it, it was discovered in 1928. And you can see um, kind of from that time forward, we've had a lot of antibiotics developed and, and people started living and surviving um, infections. Um, if you look at 1900, the top three causes of death were all infection related. Um, thinking about respiratory illnesses like pneumonia and flu, tuberculosis, or even infectious diarrhea. And then if you look in 2019, the top three causes of death were heart disease, cancer, and unintentional injuries or accidents. And so in 2019, the top three, even if you look at the, the top 10 causes of death, there's only uh, one of the top 10 that was even an infection related cause. And so um, infections that used to be very detrimental and cause a lot of morbidity and mortality um, antibiotics have, have really come a long way in helping us prevent that. Um, but antibiotics are great when we have infections that can be treated, but when they're, when we're not having infections, uh, antibiotics can cause more harm than good. Sometimes antibiotics are not benign. They can cause a lot of side effects. Uh, even when they're, when they are needed, um, people can experience side effects like rash and dizziness, uh, stomach upset. You can get yeast infections. In fact, one out of every five uh, visits to the emergency department for a medication-related adverse event is due to an antibiotic. Um, if you look at the pediatric population, it's the number one cause of adverse medication events leading to a child having to go to the emergency department. So, um, Antibiotics, yeah, they're great and wonderful, but they also cause some side effects, and we have to be careful about that. Um, if you look at uh, studies that have looked at the daily estimated harm um, or the risk associated with antibiotics, for every additional day that you take an antibiotic, um, your risk of having a side effect to the antibiotic goes up by about 4%. Um, and there's other things that can happen with antimicrobial resistance, uh, infections like C. difficile or, or uh, yeast infections. Those can be problematic. But um, the point here is that every day that we take an antibiotic, um, we're at risk for a side effect. Um, this study looked at the association between um, continuing an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam antibiotic and the risk of C. diff um, or infectious diarrhea caused by Clostridioides difficile um, when we're treating infections uh, in the bloodstream. And so a lot of these infections, they don't necessarily need to be treated with an anti-pseudomonal. If they're susceptible to uh, narrower spectrum antibiotics, we could usually use a more targeted therapy. And this study looked at the risk of C. diff 
and found that it was two and a half times higher risk if you continued an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam for longer than 72 hours compared to patients who had that antibiotic discontinued or switched to a more targeted agent um, within 72 hours. And so um, definitely something that we want to be cognizant of and try to minimize that risk as much as possible. Um, in addition, antibiotics are just different than other medications. And what I mean by that is that they suffer from transmissible loss of efficacy over time. Um, and what that means is basically the more we use antibiotics, the less effective they become, even when we use them appropriately. Um, when we use them inappropriately, if we're overusing them or misusing them, that kind of speeds this process up. Um, but the more we use antibiotics, the less effective they become. And that less effectiveness it affects all of us. Um, there's no other class of medication that that's true. Uh, if you think about uh, blood pressure medications or, or cholesterol medications, we would be in a world of hurt if the way somebody else used that medication impacted the way it works for us. Um, but that's the case with antibiotics. If we prescribe z packs to everybody that walks into an urgent care for a respiratory illness, eventually, and this is what we've seen, is that they become less effective. Now, if you have a true bacterial infection, a z pack is not very effective um, to treat that, and we have to think about other options. Um, and so we have to really try to discern, um, does somebody have an infection that's caused by a bacteria, um, or is it caused by a virus that antibiotics aren't really helpful for? And so thinking about antibiotic resistance and this loss of efficacy over time, uh, there's this study really looked at the effect of the duration that we continue an antibiotic and the risk of that resistance development um, and whether or not um, a certain duration is associated with a cap or a maximum effect of that resistance development risk. And what they found is that the longer you treat somebody with an antibiotic, the risk continues to, to go up that you're going to eventually have an infection or be colonized with a multi-drug resistant organism. Um, so there's not this magic threshold that if, if you have an antibiotic um, and you take it for a week or so, that that risk just kind of levels off and you really don't have an increased risk for, for example, if you take it for two weeks compared to one week, if you take it for two weeks, you have even higher risk of having resistance in the future than if you take it for one week. And so what we're really um, doing a lot of now, um, based on the evidence that we have available to us, is um, limiting antibiotic exposures to the shortest effective durations possible. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. But to touch on antibiotic resistance a little bit more, um, this is some trends of um, I'm going to show you a couple of different pathogens, but this first one is uh, E. coli. So this is the most common community acquired uh, pathogen that we see cause infections uh, for a variety of things. Um, this is a very common UTI kind of organism. Um, UTIs are fairly common in the community. And what you can see here is that over the last 20 years or so, um, we have seen more and more resistance develop um, even among just routine bacteria that we see common in community acquired infections. If you look at Staph aureus, um, this is essentially what causes a lot of our skin and soft tissue infections, um, abscesses, things like that. It's very common as well in the community and in the hospital. But what this really shows is that there's a high rate of drug resistant Staph aureus or what we call MRSA, um, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And it's around 50% of all the Staph aureus is drug resistant. And we have to use more um, toxic agents to be able to effectively treat that compared to being able to use a beta-lactam antibiotic, for example. And then if you look at Enterococcus specium in particular, um, this is another common pathogen that we see um, a lot of times in the hospital, somebody that has a lot of healthcare exposure, but it can be associated with community onset infections as well. 
um, there's a very high rate of resistance among this pathogen too. You can see about 75% of all isolates of this organism are resistant to the antibiotic vancomycin. Um, and even more than that is resistant to some of our simple beta-lactams that we like to use. And so um, when you start looking at treating this organism, the, the treatment options are very limited and it can be a very challenging thing to treat. Um, we think about, if you think back to the, the first slide about life expectancy and how we've had uh, we've come a long way from infections being a high risk of mortality. Well, when we start seeing antibiotic resistance um, and you start having things that are more difficult to treat or we have to re resort back to more toxic agents, um, we really start entering back into that pre-antibiotic era um, where things are um, a lot harder to deal with and, and infections can be a, a major cause of um, morbidity and mortality. But on top of that, um, in the last two or three years since COVID has really taken everything over, um, we've seen huge impacts of the COVID pandemic on multidrug resistance um, among a variety of organisms. Um, virtually all of our hospital onset um, pathogens that we see very commonly um, in our health systems we have seen a dramatic increase in the incidence of resistance among these pathogens. Um, and it's related to high rates of antibiotic use, people being in the hospital for very long stays. We have a lot more people having to undergo invasive interventions and they're on life support like the ventilator or renal replacement therapy, um, ECMO, some of those things that um, it's nice to have these uh, these technologies to keep people alive, but a lot of these things put people at risk for more infections and then we have to use more antibiotics. And uh, when we see that kind of event, it basically snowball effects into this, um, this problem of increased antimicrobial resistance. And so I've talked a lot about antimicrobial resistance and highlighted how, how it's increasing and becoming a problem, but why is this a big deal? Um, don't we just have additional antibiotics sitting on a shelf or do we not have a lot of new antibiotics coming to market um, that can just take care of this? Uh, I mean, we're it's 2022. Do we not have the means to, to deal with some of this stuff? And so I wanna show you some, some data to answer this question. Um, this data is from the Lancet um, just this year in 2022. It's estimated that 1.2, 1.27 million deaths um, in 2019 are directly attributed to antimicrobial resistance. And this slide on the right, um, basically these, these uh, six pathogens listed here are responsible for about 80% of all the antimicrobial resistant deaths. Um, and the UK has published a report that's estimated that if we do not take action and address the antimicrobial resistance problem that this 1.27 million that we saw in 2019 by the year 2050 um, and 2050 sounds like it's a long ways away but that's just 25 to 30 years away um, it's estimated by that time if if we stay on the trajectory that we're currently on that the the number of deaths attributed to antimicrobial resistance can be as high as 10 million um, so basically tenfold what it was in 2019. And so um, it's a huge problem. It's a, it's a huge public health um, threat that we really need to try to tackle and, and, and get under control before it gets out of hand. Or we're going to be living in um, essentially a post-antibiotic era um, where, where it's much like what it was in the early 1900s and, and prior. But antimicrobial resistance has other problems. Um, not only does it cause a lot of, of death, um, but it also can cause a lot of morbidity in terms of um, longer hospital stays, um, requirements for additional surgery or procedures, or people needing more intensive care. Um, all of these things increase healthcare costs and resources. We use a lot of resources to take care of these patients and try to prevent spread to other patients. Um, but ultimately, this impacts that patient and their family, and, and people end up missing a lot of work and other activities, and um, it kind of puts their life on hold while we're dealing with these infections and trying to take care of them. 
Um, basically, all the things that we consider modern medicine are at risk if we do not have effective antibiotics. Routine surgical procedures, getting your gallbladder taken out, elective procedures um, that seemingly are routine, if we cannot give you an effective uh, prophylactic antibiotic and prevent you from getting an infection from surgery, those things are no longer safe to do. Um, think about all the people with various forms of cancer who need chemotherapies and these immunosuppressing medications um, from transplant procedures, all of these things that um, are really remarkable that we can, we can help people live longer and, and help them live um, healthy, normal lives. Uh, they put people at risk of infections because we suppress their immune system. And if they get infections that we can't treat, well, these things are no longer um, safe to do. And think about all the critically ill patients that the advanced technologies that we have to, to take better care of patients these days and, and help them kind of get through their severe illness um, and get back to their, their normal life. The invasive things that we have to do to keep these people um, keep them alive with a ventilator or renal replacement therapy or ECMO, some of these things. So they have a lot of lines and drains and tubes. Um, all of those things put you at risk for infections. We need to be able to, to prevent those things and also treat it if it does become a problem. Even the ordinary infections, uh, think about people with UTIs or a skin infection or just a run of the mill pneumonia um, if we don't have effective antibiotics, those things are no longer ordinary, and we can no longer just give a, a short course of antibiotics and, and knock it out. Uh, those things are uh, much more risky um, if we don't have effective antibiotics. And so looking at our antibacterial pipeline, you can see that back in the 1980s, um, we had 15 antibiotics coming to market. Um, in that five five year period in between 1983 and 1987. And since that time, almost every year, the number of antibiotics that come to market gets lower and lower and lower. In, in the period of 2008 to 2013, um, we were at our lowest point. There was basically three antibiotics that came to market. Um, and there was some urgency around that. Um, and we had government agencies get involved and there were some initiatives put in place to try to develop new antibiotics. And um, you can see that's where there was a little bit of a boom between 2014 and 2018. We had um, eight or nine agents come to the market. But then here we are in the last five years or so, and we're back in the same boat we were in in 2008 to 2013. So it's not like we do have new shiny antibiotics sitting on a shelf that can treat the next um, threat of a pathogen. Um, we just don't have that many options. And even the options that we have available that are new, they're not necessarily novel classes of antibiotics. Um, they're really redesigns of things that have already existed. And so this timeline of antibiotic class discoveries kind of paints this picture really nicely. Um, you can see that it was in the earlier 1900s up through the 1970s um, when we really had the boom of all of the antibiotics um, that we still use today. Um, and then in the early 2000s, we had a couple of novel classes of antibiotics come to market. Um, and this was really addressed at the community acquired MRSA um, rise that we started to see in the in the 1990s. And so these couple of classes of antibiotics were targeted at treating MRSA. And so now we have a handful of agents that can treat that organism. Um, but now we're still seeing a lot of problems with resistant gram negatives um, and, and these routine bacteria like E. coli, Klebsiella, that are now resistant to a lot of the antibiotics that we've had in existence for quite a while. Um, and so the new antibiotics that we have, they don't really show up on this, this timeline because they're redesigns of, of beta-lactams, for example, or maybe we have a new fluoroquinolone that came to market, those sorts of things. And so we really need more research and development going into uh, how can we counteract the resistance that we're seeing with these pathogens and really get that under control to, 
to offer better therapies and treatments for our patients. In addition, uh, kind of what accelerates this, and I, I mentioned this a little bit previously, is when we use antibiotics um, inappropriately or unnecessarily, we speed up that process. Um, and as much as this has been an issue for the last 10 to 20 years, you would think we would be a little bit better at using antibiotics than we are. Um, but some recent data published just this year um, highlights that even relatively recently, um, when we look at patients who get antibiotics prescribed in the emergency departments or when they're admitted to the hospital um, with fairly routine infections like community acquired pneumonia, urinary tract infections, you can see that a very high proportion of patients, 75% plus of these patients have something wrong with their antibiotics that are prescribed. Either it's a the wrong antibiotic, um, the wrong dose of an antibiotic, or maybe it's not even the right diagnosis. Maybe we think they have a UTI or a pneumonia, but in fact, it's a heart failure exacerbation, or they have a urinary pathogen in a culture, but they really don't have an infection because they don't have any symptoms. It's just colonization or asymptomatic bacteria. Um, and then when you look at the antibiotics that are prescribed, um, when we give things like fluoroquinolones or vancomycin, um, high proportions of the use of those two antibiotics are also unnecessary. Um, either that was not the preferred therapy for a patient um, where we could have used a safer alternative like a beta-lactam antibiotic um, or something about it with its dose or its monitoring um, for safety, something about it was, was inappropriate. And so we need to do a better job um, with our usage of antibiotics when we do need them. It's estimated that anywhere between 30 and 50% of all antibiotic use, both in the hospital and in the outpatient setting is, is not correct. Um, and we need to do a better job. Why is it so high? What can we do better? Um, if you look at community prescribing of antibiotics, um, the South, um, the, the region that I'm probably speaking to the most people um, from and at, during this call, um, we have a lot of overuse of antibiotics or very high rates of antibiotic prescriptions per capita compared to the rest of the country. Um, if you look at Alabama specifically, we're among the highest. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do to do a better job of, of, of using antibiotics appropriately and, and not using them when they're, when they're not indicated. But when they are indicated, we need to do a better job of using them um, safely and, and in a more preferred way. And so how can we help? Um, I'm going to go through three different things, um, three different topics that are really things that all of us can do and contribute to um, to help improve this, this problem. The number one thing we can do is prevent infections. If we are avoiding infections, um, infections usually lead to antimicrobial use. And so if we prevent the infection in the first place, that's that many fewer antibiotics that we have to give. Um, I think that something that we're all very aware of and familiar with um, from from recent times is COVID and how COVID vaccines have really um, changed the, the landscape of, of how we deal with this infection. And so um, this graph really shows that among people 50 years of age and older, um, that if you're vaccinated, especially if you're fully vaccinated, you essentially have a five times lower risk of death than somebody that's not vaccinated. Um, and COVID is just kind of the newest example of this, but if you really look back, here's 14 diseases that we have vaccines for, and a lot of these you've probably almost forgotten about because we don't have to deal with these routinely because a lot of these are routine childhood vaccinations. Um, the things that we have started seeing more recently are emerging in, in areas that have lower uptake of vaccinations. Um, you have more and more kids who are not getting um, measles vaccines and you start to see measles outbreaks and things like that. Things that should be a problem of the past um, are starting to reemerge um, 
and this just highlights the importance of, of vaccines. When we get vaccinated and we have that herd immunity around us, um, we see a lot fewer infections. And so preventing infection um, has a lot to do with with vaccines, but it also has a lot to do with our, our routine infection prevention and control measures. And there's, there's great synergy between infection prevention and control and antimicrobial stewardship. Antimicrobial stewardship and reducing unnecessary antibiotic use can help decrease infections and colonizations caused by multi-drug resistant organisms or things like C. diff. Um, and so there's a lot of bundles and, and measures that are put in place with hand hygiene and, and isolation precautions and a lot of targeted measures to prevent line related infections, uh, urinary catheter infections, ventilator associated pneumonias and things like that. All these things that we do um, to prevent infections um, works really well when you have good stewardship practices that also help limit the multi-drug multi resistant organisms. So if we do a really good job limiting antibiotics, but nobody washes their hands, we're just going to have outbreaks of infections spreading around our hospitals or in our communities. But if you, if you have these two things combined together, um, it's very effective. In fact, a study found that it was actually 30% more effective. Um, antimicrobial stewardship programs were 30% more effective when you combine that with infection prevention and control measures. So this, this point cannot really be understated enough. Um, this is so important. The second thing that we can do is reduce unnecessary antibiotic use. And so we have several national consensus guidelines that give us a lot of, of tips and guidance for how to appropriately use antibiotics and things that we can do to improve our usage of antibacterials. There's also a, an entire guideline focused at how to improve our use of antifungal agents. The CDC has published guidance for antimicrobial stewardship for the hospital setting, outpatient clinics and, and doctor's offices, nursing homes, and even resource limited settings. And then even some of our uh, regulatory agencies like the Joint Commission and CMS, um, they all have standards that, that really promote the use of antimicrobial stewardship and give us guidance for what this should look like. Um, and if you look at the primary literature, there's really been an exponential growth over the last five to 10 years of, of publications coming out, giving us examples and um, tips on how to do antimicrobial stewardship better. And so what does this look like? Um, I'm going to highlight some common approaches. Um, so if you look at the collective recommendations from all these groups, and if you look at the primary literature that's emerged, there's kind of on a high level, the common themes are aimed at these four points. Essentially, how do we prevent unnecessary antimicrobial initiation? Um, one of the biggest problems around this is thinking about the treatment of asymptomatic bacteria. I cannot tell you um, how many people in doctor's offices, in the hospital, um, anywhere that you come in contact with the healthcare system, um, people always like to order and collect urine cultures, um, regardless of whether or not that has anything to do with a patient's presentation or symptoms. And it inevitably will grow an organism because the urine is not necessarily sterile, and especially not when we have a sample collected and maybe it sits out on a, on a shelf at room temperature for a while before it's ever processed. Um, so handling of specimens the appropriate way. All these things can lead to a positive urine culture. Um, and just because it grows, a lot of people feel like that warrants antibiotic treatment. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. If somebody doesn't have symptoms of a UTI, they don't really need antibiotics unless there's some very rare exceptions to that rule. Um, and so that's just one example, but essentially any time that antibiotics are not indicated, we want to prevent using antibiotics in those scenarios. Um, the, other, the other scenario here um, that's a common approach to stewardship 
is stopping antibiotics quickly when maybe an infection is suspected, but then we rule it out. There's a number of syndromes that can mimic infections, um, but they may ultimately not be an infection. And sometimes it takes us two or three days to sort some of that out for somebody that's admitted to the hospital and maybe they're acutely ill. Um, we need better diagnostics. We need to, to have better interpretation of, of presentations and diagnostic and lab values and imaging results um, that can help us rule out infection to limit antibiotic use. Um, to be honest, if it's one of these scenarios where it's not a slam dunk that somebody has an infection, we need to be reevaluating the use of an antibiotic every single day until we have a definitive diagnosis. Um, and then if we have an infection and we know what we're treating, the use of a targeted rather than a broad spectrum antibiotic um, is always recommended if we know what that pathogen is. Um, think back to those early slides I showed you where those broad spectrum antibiotics, every additional day that we continue those, you're, you're further increasing the risk of driving or selecting out for a resistant infection. Um, and then you end up having a subsequent infection in the future that's untreatable or, or more difficult to treat. Um, they also put you at more and more risk of things like C. diff or other side effects. Um, you could remember that, that other slide that showed if you continue these broad spectrum antibiotics for more than 72 hours, you have a two and a half times increased risk of developing C. diff. Um, that's a problem. So if we can use a targeted agent um, for whatever we're treating, that's going to be preferred. And then anytime we can limit antimicrobial therapy to the shortest effective duration, that's going to help us um, avoid those unnecessary um, unnecessary risk of side effects, unnecessary risk of, of resistance development in the future. So shorter is better. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more in a second. Um, so I want to highlight what this really looks like. And so a lot of those approaches I talked about are, are essentially limiting antibiotic use. Um, and here at UAB, we've had a longstanding program that we consider a fluoroquinolone pre-authorization program. Um, and essentially what that means is that for somebody to use a fluoroquinolone antibiotic in our hospital, um, an agent like ciprofloxacin, um, a very commonly used antibiotic, um, and you essentially would need to get authorization or permission from an infectious diseases um, attending physician to be able to prescribe that antibiotic. Um, or the patient would have to meet certain criteria for that antibiotic to be um, available to them without that approval. And so this figure essentially shows the long-term impacts of that. If you look back um, in the late 90s to the early 2000s, um, these blue bars represent our usage of fluoroquinolones here at our hospital. And in 2004, we had the highest use of fluoroquinolones. And in 2007, we implemented this pre-authorization program. And so you can see that our use of fluoroquinolones um, was really high and we dramatically cut that down when we implemented this pre-authorization program. And we've maintained much lower usage of fluoroquinolones over a decade or longer period of time. Um, but what that translates to and, and, and what the long-term effects of this um, translates to is what all these colorful lines are showing us. And so if you look at these, each of these lines represents a different gram negative organism for which fluoroquinolones are commonly used for. Um, most of these represent common hospital acquired pathogens. Um, e. coli is still a very common community acquired pathogen. But what we saw is when we were using more and more fluoroquinolones, we were having reduced susceptibility um, in our hospital to these, um, among these agents or among these pathogens to the fluoroquinolone class. So um, when you look at the early 2000s, fluoroquinolones were not a very effective agent for us to be able to use. Um, and so 
if you think about fluoroquinolones, they're one of the few oral, they're essentially the only oral antibiotic that we can use for some things like pseudomonas, for example. Um, if we can't use a fluoroquinolone, you essentially have to use IV antibiotics and um, that creates a lot of challenges. But when we started limiting our use and cut this off, you can see that over a decade of time, we started seeing improvements in our susceptibility rates to where these antibiotics, um, when we were overusing them, they were essentially becoming non-effective. Um, but when we start using them more conservatively and only when they're really needed, now they're a much more useful agent for us here at our hospital. Um, so we're not limiting antibiotics to be the antibiotic police. That's not the goal of, of antimicrobial stewardship. The goal is to prevent these problems with antimicrobial resistance um, and, and maintain, preserve the utility of these important drugs for the future. And then looking at limiting antibiotic durations to the shortest effective duration, um, I just want to highlight this slide. Um, an infectious diseases physician out of California named Brad Spielberg, um, he keeps this up to date and has a running list on his website um, that I reference here at the bottom of the slide. But essentially, this is 17 conditions. Most of these are very common types of infections where we have studied um, different durations of therapy. And, and essentially, you've got a short duration compared to a longer duration. And the longer durations are what have historically or traditionally been prescribed for these things. Um, and among these 17 conditions, this represents over 120 randomized controlled trials. In virtually every case, the shorter duration was equally effective as the longer duration. And so the conclusion is made that shorter is better. And you say, well, wait a minute, Matt, you just told me that they were equal. Um, and when you look at efficacy and outcomes, they're essentially equivalent. But the reason that the shorter duration is better than the longer duration is because you have less exposure to antibiotics causing less risk of side effects, less risk of resistance development, less risk of C. diff and yeast infections and things like that, those complications. So if you can have an equal effectiveness and lower risk of, of the complications or the negative uh, consequences of antibiotic use, then it truly is better to use those shorter durations of therapy. And so the third thing I wanna talk about is when we have a proven infection, we want to optimize the treatment of that infection. And so this really revolves around what I like to call the five rights. And so you have the right diagnosis, the right antimicrobial, the right dose of that antimicrobial, the right route of administration, and the right duration. And so I spent a lot of time on the, the previous section talking about limiting unnecessary use of antibiotics. Um, a lot of times talking about, well, we need to make sure that we have the right diagnosis and we're using proper durations of therapy to limit unnecessary use. So I want to focus on in this section, um, the right antimicrobial, the right dose and the right route. And so when we think about the right antimicrobial, this relies on the fact that we have the right diagnosis. We need to know what we're treating um, to know how to best treat that infection. Um, and this also relies on identification of what is the pathogen causing that infection. Um, and the ultimate focus here is if we know what we're treating, and we know what's causing that infection, the faster or the, the more prompt we can be starting effective therapy, the better outcomes that we're going to see for our patients. And so um, there's been a lot of, of recent investigation and, and study looking at rapid diagnostic techniques technology um, and combining these rapid diagnostic tests with antimicrobial stewardship intervention to improve patient outcomes. And so what, what we've seen is when you combine these technologies um, with stewardship support, uh, meaning that if you have a test result, some sort of appropriate action needs to be taken on those results, or it's not really going to make a difference. Maybe you have a fancy test, but if, if the test gets reported and, and nobody looks at it until 24 hours later, um, then is it really making a difference? Um, and so when we combine these things together, what we see is you have a much faster time to effective therapy. 
um, which ultimately translates to shorter hospital stays and even lower mortality rates. Um, what we know about patients who have severe infections, thinking about patients with infections leading to sepsis or septic shock, or, or um, if we have multi-drug resistant infections that maybe our initial antibiotic therapy was not effective for, um, and, and it takes us two or three days to get susceptibilities to learn that our initial therapy was not effective. Um, what we've learned in these scenarios is that the longer it takes us to get an effective therapy on board, the worse outcomes a patient will have. And so um, having this rapid technology to identify what is causing an infection, to know right away what the causative pathogen is, um, and whether or not there may be any resistance um, that may be expressed in vitro. Um, if we know those things um, very early, we can get people on appropriate therapy um, and, and improve their outcomes. And so um, the, the more we can avoid these delays, the better patients are gonna do. And then when we talk about the right dose, uh, I'm not going to belabor this too much because it gets into the, the weeds of um, things that are more pharmacy focused with pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics um, and toxicodynamics. So the interplay between um, the dose that we use of an antibiotic and, and how somebody's body responds to that and how it may or may not put them at risk of a side effect. But the ultimate thing here is we want to use the best dose for every individual patient for for whatever their infection is. And so the focus here is giving them a dose that's going to be effective, but also safe. And what this figure on the right shows is that if we are able to hit our targets in terms of um, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic targets, in terms of that, um, if we use the right dose, that is associated with better outcomes. And um, what we see is that if we are more likely to hit the target um, that is associated with better outcomes, patients do better clinically. And that just makes sense. But when you have patients who are critically ill um, that have altered hemodynamics or they're, they're relying on a lot of different external measures of organ support like renal replacement therapy or maybe somebody's in acute kidney injury and, and they're not clearing medications as fast as they would be if, if they had normal renal function. All of those things go into play um, in helping us um, determine if we are using a safe, effective dose for a patient. And so um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to be giving patients um, the best dose, which translates into the best outcomes. And then when we think about the right route of administration, um, there's a big discussion about do we use an IV antibiotic or an oral antibiotic? And what we've learned is that oral antibiotics are almost always just as good as IV antibiotics um, if you have an oral antibiotic that can be absorbed and has good exposure or bioavailability um, compared to like an IV antibiotic. And so anytime that we have that available to us, um, using an oral antibiotic can decrease the risk of an IV line complication or an IV line related infection. Um, the sooner we can transition a patient to an oral antibiotic, um, the sooner they can probably get out of the hospital. So it can help shorten length of stay. Um, but patients also would prefer to take an antibiotic orally. I don't know about you, but I would much rather take a pill um, than be hooked up to an IV or have a pick line that I have to go home with. Um, I just, I would not be as happy about that. And so if a patient has a functioning gut and we know that they can get um, their medications absorbed and then be effective, um, then we want to use that. And so there's been some um, studies that have looked at this and really challenged a lot of dogma. Historically, we've thought of certain, certain serious or invasive infections as needing or requiring IV therapy, and that's just not the case. Um, in fact, some of these uh, bone infections, blood infections that we've historically used IV antibiotics for, and we now have numerous uh, randomized controlled trials that show that oral therapy is just as effective as IV therapy, but patients really need to meet certain criteria for that to be a possibility. But when that is a possibility, 
um, there's really no advantage to using IV antibiotics. So if a patient is clinically and hemodynamically stable, um, oral therapy is, is great. Um, source control needs to be achieved. So if someone has um, some sort of surgical procedure that needs to be con performed to, to drain an abscess, for example, or if there's a line that needs to be removed, um, we need to have good source control of an infection. If they can absorb and tolerate ana uh, oral antibiotics or other oral medications, um, and if we have evidence or published data saying that the oral antibiotic that we want to use has, has been effective for the infection that we need to treat, um, all of those things make it possible to use oral antibiotics. Um, and then sometimes there may be psychosocial or logistical reasons that an IV antibiotic may be necessary, but um, those are really few and far between. And so um, always look for those opportunities to switch a patient to oral antibiotics. Um, and then the other way we can optimize the treatment of infections is to involve experts who know how to treat infections. Our infectious diseases um, physician colleagues, they are trained to treat infections. And so um, there's been numerous studies that over and over again for serious and invasive infections like Staph aureus bacteremia, enterococcal bacteremia, uh, candidemia, um, these people with these bloodstream infections, if we have an infectious diseases attending physician um, see these patients, somebody that's an expert in managing these, these types of infections, patients have better outcomes. Um, imagine that. You would, that just makes sense, right? But um, a lot of places, uh, they don't necessarily have infectious diseases attendings available to them, um, depending on the area that they work. Or, or some places uh, may have uh, primary teams that don't necessarily reach out to these colleagues to ask for their assistance. But here at UAB, we have automatic ID consultations for these kinds of infections where we have proven data to say that, that there's better outcomes and, and patients are at lower risk from complications and, and lower risk of death when we have experts involved in their care. And so ultimately, who is responsible for antimicrobial stewardship? This sounds like a big task, a big undertaking. And so how do we tackle this? This is a major issue. And so here at UAB, um, we have a multidisciplinary approach, um, and it involves literally everybody from hospital leadership all the way down to frontline clinicians, including primary teams, our frontline nursing colleagues, um, our laboratory colleagues, um, we have pharmacy, infection prevention, infectious diseases, um, all of these people work together and ultimately the patient and, and the patient's family is at the center of everything that we do. Um, we all want to optimize care, um, but it's really everybody's business. And so I just wanted to highlight this slide um, that really shows that regardless of what profession you're in, um, there are a lot of things that you probably do in your routine daily tasks that are considered or antimicrobial stewardship or that contribute to antimicrobial stewardship. And so um, I would encourage you to, to take a look at this and, and, and kind of make a mental checklist to say, hey, I, I do all of those things. And instead of it being your routine job responsibility, start focusing on it as, hey, I'm contributing to antimicrobial stewardship. Take credit for that. Take pride in the fact that um, you are doing things that can help improve the use of antibiotics and limit the emergence of, of complications and antimicrobial resistance. And so um, really it's, it's all of our issues and it's something that we all work together on. And so in summary, Antibiotics are important life-saving medications, um, but when they are not needed, they can cause more harm than good. And so antimicrobial stewardship is really um, the efforts we put in place to help protect our patients and preserve the utility of antibiotics. Um, and it's important to know that everybody can be a steward. And so I hope that um, you'll take some things away from this presentation and, and uh, use it moving forward in your daily practice and 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 look for ways to say, hey, I can be an antimicrobial steward myself. Um, and with that, um, that concludes my presentation. I appreciate everybody listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time.
And thank you so much, Dr. Brown. It's it's really scary to think about an anti, uh, a world that where antibiotics aren't effective anymore. So I'm glad we're having this discussion. It's very important. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came in, and I know we only have a few minutes, but one of them is, do you feel the reason new antibiotics are not coming to the market is because one, the research is not happening or not being funded, or two, because the research is being done, but we haven't been able to find that antibiotics, new antibiotics that work? Sure, uh, that's a great question. Um, and the simple answer is, there's a decent amount of research and development taking place, but it's probably honestly not nearly enough. Um, it, it takes a lot to bring any medication to the market. There's so many steps and such a long drawn out process to get a drug from the initial phase of, de of development onto the shelf in a pharmacy essentially. And so that's such a big process and undertaking. Um, and if you think about it, there's a lot of work and effort going into that for something that may not have a big return on investment for a drug company. And so um, if you think about an antibiotic, I'm over here telling you how we need to limit the use and use them for the shortest effective duration possible. Um, and so there's not a lot of incentive for these drug companies to try to do this research and development because if they bring a new drug like this to market, we immediately want to protect it and not use it unless we really need it. Whereas things that drug companies like to develop are chronic condition medications that some something that somebody's going to be prescribed and they're probably going to need to take that antibiotic or take that medication for the rest of their life. So like a blood pressure medication or a diabetes medication, um, things like that. And so um, that's really where a lot of the the government agencies getting involved and in, in creating some initiatives um, helped with this. They, they provided incentives to drug companies for research and development. Um, and that created some new antibiotics and we have some available to us, but even the ones that became available, we already see resistance to those. And so um, it continues to be an issue. And I think we're gonna need um, people and, and, and drug companies to think outside the box of what that needs to look like. Um, to really get us to a point where we have effective agents to treat infections. And thank you so much. We are, we are at the top of the hour and unfortunately out of time, but we just want to say thank you so much again, Dr. Brown, for a fantastic presentation. And thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you hopefully on the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much.